which holiday had the smallest attendance, including 4th of July, <laughs> Father's Day, Mother's Day, one of the highest. It's kind of like dads, we kind of got it rough lately in our culture, in our society. It's almost like they're trying to cancel dads. They're trying to change our roles, trying to change who we are and what our responsibilities are. And it's the culture we're living in, but when that happens, how many believe the enemy must be behind? The enemy must be behind that sort of thing. Listen to some of these statistics. When it comes to children who are raised without fathers, and, and before I get into this, I, I, don't, I don't want to say anything that beats up on single moms. You guys are amazing, and, and you're hanging on to the promises of God that say, I'll be a husband, I'll be a father, I'll be a dad. And you are doing an amazing job. And thank God for the church that stands with you. And I, I hope that you feel that strength. But these are the statistics, and they're pretty shocking, of kids that are raised without dads. Amongst White families, 21%, 21% are now fatherless. Hispanics, 31%, 31% are without a father. In African-American families, it's up to 50% are raising children without fathers. Are y'all beginning to understand there's a problem? And it's traced back to a fatherless generation. And that's not counting homes that have fathers that are about worthless. Or, or almost to the point where they'd be better off without them. Some of you single moms know what I'm talking about. That you had a dad in the home, but it was to the point where it was actually a negative thing because he was a negative example and he was tearing things up. So that's not even counting those situations where there's still a dad. But listen, 90% of all runaways come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists came from fatherless homes. 85% of incarcerated minors, 85% came from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts came from fatherless homes. 75% of those that are in substance abuse treatments came from fatherless homes. 71% of all pregnant teenagers came from fatherless homes. 63% of all teen suicides were from fatherless homes. I almost want to quit and just, let's just pray right now. It's a crisis that the media ignores because they have an agenda. Children with behavioral behavioral disorders, 85% of them came from fatherless homes. They are four times more likely to be in poverty than those who have fathers. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, that, that's the bad news. Paul realized this situation. He said, I'm not writing this to embarrass you or to shame you, but to correct you as the children I love. Say, I love. For although you have countless babysitters in Christ telling you what you're doing wrong, you don't have many fathers who correct you in love. 
But I'm a true father to you. For I became your father when I gave you the gospel and brought you into union with Jesus, the anointed one. Uh So I encourage you, my children, to follow the example that I live before you. That's why I've sent my dear son Timothy, whom I love, He is faithful to the Lord Yahweh and will remind you of how I conduct myself as the one who lives in union with Jesus, the anointed one, and of the teachings that I bring to every church everywhere. I like verse 20. It says, for the kingdom realm of God comes with power, not simply impressive words. This is more what we need today. Teachers are good. Mentors are good. You know, there are mentors and then there are tormentors. Guides, people who protect us, people who instruct us, maybe even people who fuss at us, Paul's saying. All that's good, but he's saying we got a thousand of them. We have plenty of people with opinions. But watch what he said there. We need the power of God, not just words from people. All that's good, but what we really need are spiritual fathers. We've got people in authority. There are structures. But what we really need are spiritual fathers fathers and real fathers at home he says ye have not in the king james ye have not many fathers three differences the difference between teachers guides and protectors is that they do it out of duty or calling but fathers are motivated by love motive you're not hearing me They're motivated by love. Their motivation is not to correct you. Their motivation is they love you, so they correct you. How many know there's a huge difference? I can take criticism from someone that I know loves me and cares about me rather than someone, you know, like like these prophets who come in off the street thinking they're here. God sent me to correct Journey Life Center. Really? Really? Have you ever been in this? No, I've never been in the sanctuary. I'm not saying God won't ever do that, but how many know that we receive things better and God likes to use people who have a heart for us before those who don't? Obviously, God will use strangers. God will use a child. God will use a donkey. He'll correct us with a rooster. (laughs) Whatever it takes, right? But the preferred method is to put fathers into your life who can speak to you out of their love for you. Reminds me of John chapter 10, right? Verse 11, where Jesus says, I am the what kind of shepherd? So there are good and then there are others. The good shepherd gives his life. They're not in it for a paycheck. They give their life. They abandon everything else and give their life to this. But a hireling, he who is not the, the shepherd, listen, we need hirelings. Don't... This is not, a hireling is not a bad thing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But if that's all you got, you're hurting. That's why you shouldn't just be constantly, you know, every Sunday you're in another church. What? You need a father. You don't just need instruction. You don't need to just jump from instruction to instruction, from high to high to high. You need to know how to go through lows. You need a spiritual father. Uh, But a hireling who's not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming. Oh, listen, a hireling doesn't own the sheep. He feels no responsibility for the sheep. But 
but a good shepherd knows if they're hurting, I'm hurting. A hireling doesn't feel that. He's just there for the paycheck. He does a job. He does it well. He's needed. But when the wolf comes, when things get really rough, he says, you know what? I can go to another flock and they can pay me there. Maybe that's why the average stay for a pastor in the church of God is 18 months. Or two years. I think it's getting a little longer. If that were true here, you would have had 20 pastors by now. We need, you know, hirelings are good, but they flee. They don't stay. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. His job is to scatter. Can I say this? We have got to work on this because every Sunday, every Sunday, Every Sunday, 50% of the church isn't here. Lord, you see, they can't say amen. And and I'm not fussing. I know there are things you got to do. But it is still one of the Ten Commandments. You wouldn't disobey the other nine. Or maybe you would. Come on, come on. Help me out here. Give me something. Jesus. When they're dead like that first elder, you need to speak up. Help me out. The hireling flees because he is a hireling. It is his nature to flee. He has nothing invested and does not care about the sheep. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and I, I know my sheep and am known by my own. It needs to be a two way street. I can say I'm a spiritual father to some of you, but you have to reciprocate that revelation. You don't necessarily have to tell me, but you have to know that. You have to accept that. Anybody understand what I'm saying? So the difference is they are motivated by love. It's, it's Luke chapter 15, and, 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 and you, 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 you know the story about, about the so-called prodigal. And by the way, the Bible never calls him a prodigal. But he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He sent him into his field, fields to feed the swine. He's feeding pigs. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. Hello. And, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, God, help us to come to ourselves. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? He, he came to himself. I've got a spiritual father who, who will take care of me. No one else will take care of me, but a spiritual father, my father will. I will arise and go to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And his father had every right to do that. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father, he saw him because he was looking. A hireling is like, well, you're here, you're not, whatever. But the father's always A spiritual father will always be looking from afar. Some of you are way off there, but we're looking. You don't drop out of our view. Someone's always looking, and he saw him, and and number two, he had compassion. Even though his father had treated him horribly, come on. When he took that money, what he was saying is, Dad, you're dead to me. Because that's the only way you get inheritance. You're dead to me. Took his money and spent it on Gentiles. 
at least buy Jewish stuff, you know? And he ran. Say, he ran. He ran, fell on, and the reason he ran is because, listen, listen, the men of the city had every right to stone him. They could have stoned his son. So when he saw him a long ways off, he said, I'm going to go. I'm going to. There's a chance those men will stone him, and they had every legal right to do it, but he hit them off at the pass. Don't you, aren't you glad we got a spiritual father? Aren't, oh, we have a heavenly father. We have a, we have a man on the inside who's going to look out for us. Before they stone us, Jesus is there. Before they kill us, Jesus is there. We need spiritual fathers who will look out for us. Hallelujah. It was not dignified. He should not have done it. He lost respect in the community. But he said, that's my boy, and I'm going to run. I'm going to run, and I'm going to get ahead. And when he ran to him, hugged him, embraced him. Oh, somebody, go ahead and praise the Lord. Oh, my God, I felt that. Hallelujah. I feel like running around the sanctuary. Don't get critical on me. I can do it. I may not preach after that, but I can do it. Say hallelujah. I see my father running. He's not just waiting for me to get my act together. He's running. I said my father's running. Running to find me. Running to hug me. Running to make a difference in me. My father's running, running, running. My God, say hallelujah. The second difference, I got to, the second difference is that a father gives identity. We are made in the image. A hireling cannot give you identity. He, a teacher, a guide, we got a lot of them, and we need them. They can give you instruction. They can preach the word to you. They, they can do a lot of things for you, but they can't really tell you who you are. Only a father can discern the image in you because there's a difference between sowing the seeds and just adding to the growth. You'll get that about 3 p.m. The person who sows the seed, and we're talking DNA here. We're not just talking about throwing seed in the ground. We're talking about giving seed. That's different than helping what has already been planted. We need both, but you're not going to do the second without the first. Someone hmm, has to give identity. Paul, that's why Paul says, imitate me. You know, you know, in today's world, you can't stand in the pulpit and say, y'all behave like your pastor. <laughs> See, your laughing really bothers me right now. I, I don't know. I don't know. The fact of the matter is y'all do somewhat act like me. <laughs> he, says, he says, follow me as I follow the Lord. You don't hear many people put themselves on the spot like that. And if I were to say something like that, he'd say, well, he's full of himself. Who does he think he is? He's not perfect. I didn't say I was perfect. Follow me as I follow the Lord. Being a pastor, being a leader is an amazing and a, 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 an awesome responsibility because you are supposed to be the pattern and it's a heavy kind of burden that sometimes you rebel against. I can't live up to that. I don't want to live up to that. And there's too many people telling you, you don't live up to that. <laughs> but see, when you got saved, the image of God was restored to you. 
going back to the garden. Next week, we'll get back into the tabernacle, the final message. We're talking about the blood, and we're going to talk about the covenant and the mercy seat and all that stuff. And it's interesting that on the mercy seat, there are two angels there. And, and, and when Adam was thrown out of the garden, he put an angel there to keep people out. And now the angels are welcoming with open arms. Woo! I just messed up next week's message. I, when I preach that next week, act like you never heard it before. <laughs> That's the problem with preparing ahead. You get your messages mixed up. Jesus, help us. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Ye are born again. Oh, this is so, this is, a little, this is deeper than maybe you want to go. But I believe being born again means you've got new DNA. Not, not necessarily in the natural, as it were. Maybe it is. I don't, but, but not so much in the natural, but in the spiritual realm, you're given spiritual or maybe a spiritual DNA is awakened in you. Ye are born again. You are a new creation. Come on, let's not water that down. That means new DNA. Oh, Jesus. These people that believe once saved, always saved, I don't believe that. Because that means once condemned, always condemned. They say once you're in the family, you're always in the family. I'm glad that's not right because I was in a different family. <laughs> so I'm glad once, once doomed, uh, always doomed, no thank you. I've been born again. You have different DNA. I have my father's DNA. But what does that mean? You know, I, I, I look a lot like my dad. I, believe me, I got, I got the Philippi hair. We go back several generations. They all got this big head of white hair. <laughs> there, are no, there are no gray hairs in my shower. Mm -hmm. I'm not losing any. They're turning gray, but they ain't turning loose. Go I'm sorry, I've just offended people. I've... <laughs> Jesus, help us. But what does that mean? It, it doesn't mean I'm exactly like my father, but I've got his DNA. You see, you, you might have someone's, say, say, well, who's my spiritual father? That doesn't mean you're going to do the same thing as your spiritual father does. My dad and me are two completely different people. My dad built our house. <laughs> with his two hands. He may have subcontracted a few things, but he literally built our house. I remember just being five, six years old, about a little older than Jack, just going to the house, and I, I thought it was the greatest thing to go to the house that dad was building. Amen. I, I think I was six, because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't in first grade yet, so whatever age that is. And I, I would get to go and, and spend the day with Dad as he's hammering nails and stuff. It didn't do me any good. But I, I, I watched my dad. My dad. My, let me put it this way. If, if my dad lost his hammer, he would not ask me where it was. Okay. That pretty much sums it up. I don't ever remember my dad telling me, you need to learn how to do it. No, he, he never tried to make me uh, uh, do something. I don't ever remember him sitting down trying to teach me. I mean, he gave up on me early. <laughs> he did not. I, I don't ever remember him saying, son, you need to know how to change the oil. I still don't know how to change the oil. My, <laughs> at this point in my life, I don't want to know. Hey, Amen. I'm just done. But, I, you know, my dad never tried to make me in his image, but I have his DNA. I don't do the thing. My, my dad worked for Burlington Northern Railroad. He was a foreman at the car shops, what they called the car shops. He built trains for a living, and he was, he was the foreman. 
And, and, and I, that's why I have this love of trains, and Jack loves trains, and he knows every part of the train. We were on a train the other day, and he was naming, oh, there's the brake, and that's the coupler. And, uh, I mean, I can tell you things you'd have never heard of before. And he knew all the parts of the train at his age. And, and, but, but, see, it's, it's not about, you know, you becoming like your spiritual father, but that character. There's something that he passes on that makes you who you are. That's how important spiritual fathers are. It's a DNA thing. Uh, come on now. Let me get to the third difference. The third difference is authority and inheritance. A hireling has no, can give you no authority. He will in, you will inherit nothing from him. Again, 1 Corinthians 4.20 it says, uh, this last verse that we read previously, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. A spiritual father empowers you. Whereas a teacher just teaches and a guide just guides and a protector just protects. But a spiritual father can pass on something that empowers you. Watch this now. See, <clears throat> a father owns a factory. His son is 18 years old, wants to go into the job market, so he begins at his father's factory. He starts at the bottom, but everybody knows where he'll wind up because that's daddy's factory. He may run it different. He may have all kinds of different ideas, but he's going to inherit that factory. He's got to work his way up, but he's going to inherit. Amen. That, hi, that guy he hired at 18, that's not his son. He'll never own that factory. <laughs> he'll, he'll be lucky to get a raise. I mean, he's not. <laughs> there is, you see, you, you can help people, but there's a difference between helping people and being able to impart into people's lives. When you have a father, you know what your authority is. You know what your inheritance is. You know where you belong. Oh, my God. You know what's yours and what's not yours. And spiritual fathers lay their hands on you and impart that into your life. Not because they're all that, but they're just the man or woman that's appointed to be your spiritual father. I believe you could, you could possibly have more than one. It, it's, not a, it's not like you got ten. <laughs> Maybe you have a couple, but that's kind of rare. Usually it's one person. You say, who is that person? It's somebody who loves you and is in a position to impart into you. That may be your natural father. It might be the person who won you to the Lord. It might be your pastor, as much as you don't want to act like him. <laughs> but fathers, uh, you see, if he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, those are my cows. Those are my cows. The father gave the prodigal a ring, which is authority. There's a whole, you know there's a whole message here. We preached it. He gave him a ring for authority, gave him the robe of identity and authority, gave him shoes which cover the feet, which is love and compassion, and he gave him a fatted calf for provision. The father does that. Out in the world, they did nothing for him. Gave him a job feeding pigs, but that didn't make enough for him to even eat. Who is your spiritual father? Who is that person? I think you need to know. It's someone motivated by love. It reminds me of Paul. He had, he had not yet been to Rome in his journeys. And he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 11, he said, I long to see you. He had never met the Romans, Roman Christians. He said, I long to see you. Why? that I might impart some spiritual gift into you. There are people today that don't 
preachers who don't believe in impartation. That's because they're not spiritual fathers. I don't know what they are. But you need to understand the power of impartation. And it doesn't mean that the person doing it is all that powerful, but that person is willing to be the vessel through which God will use to impart into your life what you need to be the person that you're meant to be according to your spiritual DNA. Do I need to say that again? Well, I'm not because I'll never say it that well again. <laughs> Reminds me of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, right? Stir up. Stir Timothy. Listen to me. Wake up. Stir up the gift that's in you through the laying on of hands. I want the worship team to come. My God, thank you, Jesus. Oh, I feel, I feel his touch. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Back in 2008, Barack Obama was talking, speaking, and he's talking about fathers. Listen to what he said. If we are honest with ourselves, we will admit that too many fathers also are missing, missing from too many lives and too many homes. They've abandoned their responsibilities, acting like boys instead of men. And the foundation of our families are weaker because of it. You and I know how true this is in the African-American community. We know that more than half of all black children live in single-parent homes, uh, a, a number that has doubled, doubled since we were children. We know the statistics that children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in proper poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of schools, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They are more likely to have behavioral problems, run away from home, or become teenage parents themselves, and the foundations of our community are weaker because of it. And I say that's true of the church, too. How many times in the last year has this city, Chicago, lost a child at the hands of another child? How many times have our hearts stopped in the middle of the night with the sound of a gunshot? Or a siren. How many teenagers have we seen hanging around on street corners when they should be sitting in a classroom? How many are sitting in prison when they should be working or at least looking for a job? How many in this generation are willing to lose to poverty or violence? Or are we willing to lose to poverty or violence or addiction? How many? How many of us gotten a lot worse since 2008? Yes, we need more cops on the street. Yes, we need fewer guns in the hands of people that shouldn't have. Yes, we need more money for our schools and more outstanding teachers in the classroom and more after-school programs for our children. Yes, we need more jobs and more job training and more opportunities in our communities, but we also need families to raise our children. We need fathers to realize responsibility does not end at conception. We need them to realize that what makes you a man is not the ability to have a child, it's the courage to raise one. And I say amen. amen. Tomorrow is a holiday, a new holiday called Juneteenth. Amen. amen. And it goes back to celebrate. It was actually the first proclamation, which was in the state of Texas, that freed, that freed the blacks. I think it was June 19th. 157 years ago, you figure the math. 157 years ago, our first proclamation, and now we celebrate that, and I think we should celebrate that. It's all about freedom. Amen. And I think it's interesting that they chose that date. I suppose there's a lot of things they could have chosen, but I, I think now, depending on, I guess, how the calendar goes, but I may be wrong, but I, I, it seems to me like from now on, at least most of the time, this holiday will follow the day after Father's Day. And I think the two are connected. One of the things the slave owners would always do is divide up families. 
so they can control them. They would separate the fathers from the mothers, from the children. And that was a way of controlling their behavior. <laughs> Those slave owners knew something that some, of, some people can't figure out today. That families, it's difficult for families to function without a dad there. Not impossible. With God, all things are possible. Thank God for Jesus. And when you raise them in a Christian home, it's amazing how well they can turn out. Come on. If you're a single mom, don't despair. Rejoice. God said you're going to be all right. And he's making a way. But I think it's interesting that these two holidays will always be linked one, maybe one day after the other to remind us the power of family. This world's trying to tear down family, trying to redefine marriage. Trying to redefine it. And it is sacred. It's an institution that God put at the very start when there are only two people on the planet one was a dad one was a mom Adam and Eve not Adam and Steve uh, nah let's not go there you hear what I'm saying it's a man and a woman in marriage has nothing to do with us being prejudiced against anybody. It's the law of God. Amen. It's a sacred institution. Yes. Don't tear up what God instituted from the beginning of time. It's a perversion. Jesus, would you stand to your feet? Let's see what the Lord has.